Next week, an inquest opens here to try and answer questions about one of the most baffling of all modern spy stories. Gareth Williams was a well-liked and extremely talented young man from a small village on Anglesey who went to work for the secret intelligence service MI6. But he died in bizarre circumstances. Was it murder, assassination or a strange sex game gone wrong? The government's ruled that the evidence to the inquest about Gareth's work will be heard in secret. Tonight we bring together a panel of crime, terrorism and espionage experts to investigate the death of a spy. Author of best-selling book Inside British Intelligence, Gordon Thomas. Former senior detective with the Metropolitan Police Murder Squad, Dave Little. International security expert from the University of Wales, Dr. Bella Aurora. And an investigative journalist who's covered the case for the Sunday Times, Miles Goslett. In that building work Britain's real-life James Bonds, the men and women of the Secret Intelligence Service, or MI6. They gather intelligence and carry out covert operations abroad. Despite recent moves towards apparent greater openness, MI6 is by nature and necessity a highly secretive organisation. One of its staff lived here in a top floor flat in this building about a mile from MI6 HQ. His name was Gareth Williams, he was 31 and a highly intelligent mathematician. On the 23rd of August 2010, Gareth was found dead in the flat. The circumstances were bizarre. Gareth's body was found locked in a holdall similar to this one. The bag was padlocked from the outside and placed in his bath. The alarm was raised by a personnel manager at GCHQ. Obviously this is a personal tragedy. A hugely gifted young man, dearly loved by his family, dies young. But the mystery surrounding his life and death has made this a story of international interest. Miles, you've studied the events leading up to police going to Gareth's flat. Now there's a strange lag, isn't there, between Gareth, when Gareth was last seen alive, Monday the, the 15th of August, and when he was found on the 23rd. Eight days before concern seems to have grown enough for someone to go and investigate. That seems strange, doesn't it? Well, it's extraordinary, really. Um, it's 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 very curious. It's it's one of the uh, the overwhelming mysteries surrounding this case. How is it that somebody who uh, had a job such as his um, clearly did some very sensitive work could go missing for that period of time? Um, and how is it that nobody knew where he was? How is it that his employers didn't know where he was? Um, you know, these these are the sorts of questions which uh, the coroner is going to have to get to grips with. Gordon, this was an MI6 safe house is the term. What do we mean by that? Well, a safe house, by its very name, is a safe house. It's where the intelligence people put their agents when they're going out on missions, coming back, where they put people they want to in interrogate or interview. The question that this case raises to me, I think, is this. It's a safe house on five floors. He lived on the top floor. Who was in the house? in those eight days when he was dead. Did nobody see him come in? Did anybody see anybody come in? Well, the detectives are now on the scene, and let's bring in uh, the former detective, Dave Little. What would be your force first move when confronted with a crime scene like this? I think murder. Um, obviously, any suspicious death, the first thing you do is think murder, because you can nev never get the scene back. Preserve the scene, start fast-track actions, CCTV, house to house, speak to witnesses, those sort of things to find out exactly what had happened. But the most important thing is to keep the scene as it is. And who would take charge in this instance? Would it be the detectives? Would it be MI6? Or would there be a no. conflict here? No, the primacy would remain with the police to investigate the, the death. The information that MI6 want to give is what they will give. The police will deal with whatever they have. You must realise there's a very, very dif different between intelligence and evidence. And the police Although intelligence is good for us, we deal with evidence. So, police were confronted with a body and a bizarre death. But who was Gareth Williams? 
Gareth grew up here on Anglesey. He excelled at school, taking his maths GCSE when he was just 10 years old. By 17, he'd graduated from Bangor University with a first-class degree. A spell at Cambridge University followed, but his mathematical skills had brought him to the attention of GCHQ, the government's communications listening post. In 2001, it signed him up. His work over the next nine years remained shrouded in secrecy. When Gareth died, he was coming to the end of a year's secondment to MI6. As one of Britain's foremost boffins, what sort of work was he doing for the intelligence services? Well, Bella, we know Gareth was part of a team dealing with communication intercepts. What sort of threats would he be looking to combat? Well, at the time when Gareth was, was in post, this was actually a very critical time in terms of the emergence of new agendas that were formalised in policies. So 2010 in particular is when we saw the formalisation of policies relating to the national security uh, strategy of the UK and also work that was going on at NATO about developing a new strategic concept. In both of these cases, the work of, uh, related to cyber terrorism and terrorism were at the top of the agenda. It's very interesting that when he was initially discovered, um, the story that was put out was that he was a backroom boy, effectively somebody who performed lowly functions, had a lowly status within, uh, within the organisation he worked for. And, and yet we now discover that he, uh, shortly before he, he, he died, um, he completed a training course and could be deployed uh, on operations. Um, this suggests, at least, that he had a much higher status than was initially, uh, than we, we were initially told about. Because we know well, Gareth had been to the States. Yes, he had been. He'd worked at, at the National Security Agency, where he'd been playing quite an important role, learning about the tactics being used in um, Afghanistan. And that's quite important to understand his links. He wasn't just some office boy. Now, at this stage, police had very little to go on, and it's now gradually emerging that a lot of the apparent evidence was actually misleading. Detectives here faced a puzzle. There'd been no sign of forced entry at Gareth's flat, but the door had been locked from the outside. By whom? It meant that somebody had to be inside the flat when Gareth died. Neighbours have said that the building, then an MI6 safe house, had been burgled a few months earlier. Police have not confirmed this, but if true, it clearly constituted a major breach of security. Then there was the sighting of a man and woman of Mediterranean appearance who called at the building a month or two before his death. Who were they? Well, a lot more emerged about the case recently in a special hearing in front of the Westminster Coroner Mars, it seems the Mediterranean couple may not be as important as first thought. What are your feelings about that? Well, I think the Mediterranean couple are interesting, but, but in a slightly different way. The police attached enormous significance to them uh, from, from a pretty early stage, and then four months after Gareth's body was found, they put out a, a witness appeal for them. They released two photo fits. Um, Fifteen months later, uh, we, we, we hear that, in fact, this couple were, in the words of the coroner, a bit of a red herring. And a complete lack of forensic evidence in the flat. Well, I, that is obviously bizarre. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it do, you know, it, it's very difficult to dismiss the possibility that somebody else might have been into the flat and cleaned it thoroughly, forensically, because uh, I'm sure Dave will tell us how unusual it is that uh, a, a flat could be discovered with a dead body in it, but no mm. fingerprints and no DNA. Dave, have you ever worked on a case where there is no forensic evidence? I have had one. I've had a homicide where there was no forensic evidence in the room. Um, highly unlikely. It does happen, as well, it has happened once in my experience. You've got to look at it from the perspective, you've got to look at all potential options. We do not know at this stage if he did not kill himself. If he did kill himself, then there wouldn't be any other forensic evidence in there. If it happened with either his consent or otherwise, I would still expect some DNA from somebody to be in that room, quite frankly. And obviously the, the furthest extreme is that if it was forensically cleaned. Gordon, could this flat have been cleaned up? Please, some extraordinary activity happened in there, and yet it's sterile. <coughs> well, 
MI6, MI5, and GCHQ all have units that are known as housekeepers. And they go around, clean houses, safe houses or what have you, keep them tidy, that's their normal jobs, furnish them, all that stuff. They're also experts at removing any evidence. Miles, uh, the family's lawyer has said that, that there was a high probability that there was a, a third party present in the flat at the time and talk about dark arts. Mm. Um, what do you make of that? Well, I think that those were very carefully considered comments on his part. I think that he made them almost certainly with the full blessing of Gareth Williams family. Um, incidentally, they, they've, they've, they've never spoken, that certainly his, his immediate family has never spoken about, about any aspect of this matter as far as I'm aware. Um, I think it was a, a fairly provocative thing to say. Um, Bella, an unknown third party, was a member of some agencies specialising in the dark arts of the secret services. Perhaps evidence was removed from the scene post-mortem by an expert in those dark arts. The whole scenario is, is more bizarre than, than fiction itself. But I think what we're seeing here is the, the evidence seems to suggest that another party may have been involved. And I think just the sanitised nature of the, the flat, the apartment, would suggest some kind of cover-up. Could that delay in him being seen alive and his missing being reported be the time when the flat is cleaned? I think the flat would have been cleaned in a very short period of time, in fact, after, after his, his death. The eight days really allowed, in, in some sense, for that body to, to decompose further, which had an impact on the, um, the results of the post-mortem. Because the body was so decomposed for being left for that amount of time, it really skewed the results of the, the post-mortem. So it just added that extra layer of, um, of, of, of fog, in a, in a sense, to, to make sure that we don't get to the bottom of this. Going on what Bella's just mentioned, uh, your question, he was found on Monday the 23rd of August. I don't know if that was not the day he was due back at work. He had been on leave. It may be, he was a very private person, remember. He would have had no, well, he had very little contact with other people. So the fact that he lay in his apartment for whatever length of time it was, um, I don't know, but perhaps that wasn't unusual. When you hear somebody coming into a block of flats that you live in, if somebody came in eight days ago, would you make a note of it? <laughs> you know, it's just, it, I, I know you laugh, but we, the conspiracy theory is fine. However, it could well be that he went home on the 15th of August, 16th of August. He died on the 15th or 16th of August and lay there for eight days. No one was aware of that because he was a private person. He was due back at work on Monday the 23rd. And I don't know this, I'm just saying it's supposition. And that's when the alarm was raised. I don't want to confuse things further, but when you consider that he was found in a, in a holdall, it is conceivable that he died somewhere else and his body was moved uh, and, and, and put back in the flat. Well, I think it is highly it, unlikely. It is unlikely, but I mean, you know, presumably it's a line of inquiry the police must have considered. So um, another scene you're suggesting possibly? Well, it's possible, isn't it? I mean, you know, in, in, because, because, the, because there's no evidence at the flat, um, you know, one can't rule it out. But well, I would expect to find evidence leading to the flat. It, to get a body into the flat would be more difficult, quite frankly. I'm not saying it is impossible. It, it may well have been, it, and again, I think it's unlikely from what's coming out, but he may have been complicit himself. It might have been him. And if that is the case, the whole investigation stops there. Because you will never, ever find any evidence of anything else. Another key aspect to come out of this, this pre-hearing was the mix-up over potential DNA evidence, something again that we thought was a key line of inquiry, now turns out to be nothing. Well, I think again it's the Williams family who will feel most aggrieved by this, uh, this new piece of information because um, effectively they would have had false hope for many months that the police had obtained the DNA of a third party in the flat only to discover, um, you know, pretty much at the 11th hour, shortly before the inquest is due to begin, that in fact this is the result of, uh, of an error um, made by somebody at the forensics firm which was in charge of, um, mm. of e e examining that aspect of the case. As Miles quite rightly says, the family would have been devastated. They thought potentially there's an identified person um, or ident identification of a potential person. The investigative team would have felt the same way. Okay, lots to talk about. Official police statements surrounding the case 
dried up more than a year ago. Inevitably, that has led to speculation not only about Gareth's work, but about his personal life too. This gay club is just yards from MI6 headquarters at Vauxhall Cross. In the weeks following Gareth Williams' death, newspaper reports became more and more lurid. It was suggested not only that he had visited here, but also that he may have been a secret transvestite or interested in sadomasochistic sex. But had Gareth become the victim of a carefully constructed smear campaign deliberately designed to confuse investigators and perhaps to protect a killer? Until the recent pre-inquest hearing in London, there has been a complete lack of information about this case. Miles, give us an idea about the way speculation developed around Gareth's death. Uh, you just showed on the clip the, uh, the gay club that he supposedly went to. Well, I've talked to the, one of the managers of that club, um, and he said that he didn't recognise Gareth Williams um, as having visited the club before. Um, so immediately... I begin to wonder how is it the, the name of this club has even been involved in this inquiry if the people who run the club don't recognise Gareth Williams. And I think also, you know, the, the information and the smear about his, his private life, this is also part of what we can see as, as, as disinformation and a practice of using disinformation as a tool in intelligence. And disinformation is the use of information that is deliberately meant to mislead or confuse the, the, the audience, whether it be the, the police or whether it be the public. And I think this piece of information is unreliable, as, as Miles has mentioned. We're seeing the focus being taken away from his work. And MI6 were very quick in the early days <coughs> of, of the, the death in saying that it was nothing related to his work. The fact that they distance themselves at such speed suggests almost a question mark in itself. I just want to probe this, this bit about the, the, the allegations about his private life. Uh, how much does MI6 investigate his workers' private lives? Just picking up on this point that it suggested that he's visiting a gay bar right opposite the doorstep of MI6. Well, the MI6 as such do not have a bar on homosexuality. That's the first thing. They don't. However, you know, if he's a security risk, depending who he's meeting, and they think somebody's a security risk, he would be taken aside and cautioned by his line manager. And that's a normal progress within an intelligence service like that. Uh, we've, we don't know if this has happened or not. We don't know anything about this. It's very easy to spread a smear and a lie. We all know this. And the tabloid papers particularly jump at the chance to do this. Of what relevance? Is, was his sexuality in any case? And why is it that within uh, 48 hours of his body being discovered, a newspaper was reporting the fact that not only was he gay and stating it as fact, yeah, uh, but, but, but also that he was possibly a transvestite. I mean, mm. how this was relevant, and, and more to the point, where this information so-called came from is, uh, is, is, is rather unsettling. It, it could come from anywhere, and there are people who want their five minutes of fame. So it's very, very easy to ring up an editor of a newspaper and say, I've got a story. And then that's what sells newspapers. There doesn't have to be an awful lot of truth in it, I'm afraid. Well, these more lurid aspects of the case have obscured what was certainly a personal tragedy and what may also have been a national one. Gareth Williams was a young man with a bright future dearly loved by his family, they laid him to rest in this cemetery just a few miles from his childhood home. Locals here are understandably protective of the family and we were refused permission to film nearer the grave. But the funeral itself only raised interest in Gareth because one of the mourners was MI6 chief Sir John Sawyers who told the family that Gareth had done really valuable work in the cause of national security. This begged the question had Gareth also given his life in the cause of national security? And if so, who had killed him and why? To my knowledge, this is the first time that an intelligence chief of MI6, which after all is the most senior intelligence chief in the British Isles or in Britain, 
has gone to a funeral of a, an officer who was dismissed at the beginning and has been not very important. He went, he could have said, look, I'm very sorry to the family, quite simply, without having to go all the way up there with five of his people and have his five officers admitted through the side door of the chapel while he stood outside as we saw and walked amongst the family and said a few words how sorry he was, what a great man he was, and he flew out as quickly as he'd arrived. The public interest and the media focus meant that he had to come, but also, more importantly, I think the fact that he's aware that MI6 have closed doors in terms of any flow of information about the case. And so this, in a sense, was an, an element of almost a, a gesture, a goodwill gesture. But I think also it does highlight that um, Gareth's role in MI6 may have been a lot more central and prominent than it's ever been made out before. We know that the coroner is very interested in the bag. In fact, she's talked about a demonstration being possibly conducted in, in, in the court. It, uh, the suggestion is at the moment that it is virtually impossible for Gareth to have locked himself in the bag and someone else had to have been there. The, the bag was padlocked from the outside. It would have been very difficult for somebody to climb into a bag, zip it up, and then padlock it while being inside that bag. The coroner is uh, rightly focusing on this. I think she even said it was practically the centre point of the, of the entire inquest. To sum up here, uh, Gordon, what do you think may have happened or went on in that flat? What could be a, a scenario? Paint a picture for us. I think the most likely verdict is going to be an open verdict. I don't think there's an, we'll never get to the bottom of this. There's been so much washing of the truth, or what, we, what may have been the truth. Bella? Your thoughts? Do you think we'll ever get to the truth? Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get to the bottom of this, but that's just the very nature of how uh, our intelligence agencies work. But I think what we're seeing in terms of the scenario, if we're looking at a theory, I would suggest that we may have to look closer to home for those answers. Because I think even if the agencies that are on our doorstep haven't been involved directly, there's almost an element of complicity that we can suggest just by looking at the, not so much the evidence, but the lack of evidence and trying mm -hmm. to connect to the dots between those grey areas. It's hard to imagine that our own intelligence agencies don't know more than they're letting on. Dave, you're led by the evidence. Do you think we'll get the answers we want that the public want in this case? I'm not certain that you'll get the answers the public wants. Um, I'm certain that the coroner will get all the information and all the intelligence before, she, well, before uh, the inquest verdict is reached. Um, as I said earlier, intelligence is not evidence. The only thing I know for a fact is that Gareth Williams is dead. Past that, I don't know what else happened. And Miles? I think it's very unlikely that we're ever going to establish exactly what happened to Gareth Williams. I regret saying that. I think it's all very unfortunate. I think that there are too many other people who are interested in um, protecting uh, organisations in this country. Um, of course, I'm thinking of the, uh, the intelligence services more than anything else. Um, as to what happened to him, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to speculate beyond saying that I think that the uh, barrister acting for the family hit the nail on the head when he said that there was a third party present, um, they, they, they believe, um, when Gareth died. Agents proficient in the dark arts? Conceivably, but I don't think we'll ever know. Well, this case is going to continue to make headlines, as we've heard around the world, when the inquest opens next week. The coroner, Dr Fiona Wilcox, has already said it has caused much public anxiety and concern and, of course, great distress for Gareth Williams' family. Thanks to all my guests and we'll see you again next week at 7.30. Good night.